Hello, everyone. For those of us who are joining us again, welcome back. For those of you who are joining for the first time, welcome to the Genetic Care webinar series, Embracing Change. We've been talking about relationships. We've talked about communication, the opportunities that are presenting themselves for personal growth in COVID-19. Today, we're gonna to take the conversations we've had to the next level more towards the family business and family business family space. We are joined today with one of the legends, Dr. Roger King in the space, who's gonna help us discuss the three Ps and how those can help endure families to achieve family longevity and generational continuity. He's a dear friend, an incredible human being, and as you know, a professor for some of you and advisor to many of the families in Hong Kong and Asia. So without further ado, please let's welcome Dr. Roger King. Thank you very much for your time, Roger, and for being here today to share your wisdom with the families that join us online on this webinar. Please, Roger. Sorry, Roger, um, need to unmute? You're on mute. Sorry about that. Okay. There you go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, Faisal, uh, uh, for the uh, kind introduction and a uh, good opportunity for me to uh, uh, expand on some of the issues that I come across uh, on my uh, journey uh, to uh, uh, in discussion with families and so forth and so on. And the, uh, you might wonder what the, uh, the notion of what 3P is. And uh, what I think I'll do is uh, today, uh, our presentation actually be two parts. Uh, uh, the first part, we're gonna be looking specifically at the issue of the three Ps. And myself, as well as uh, uh, Faisal will uh, address this, uh, this issue. Then afterwards, uh, we have one additional session I'm gonna uh, elaborate a little bit more on the uh, three P's based on my own uh, personal experience itself. Okay, so uh, we shall move on now. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, I've been involved with family, family business uh, uh, teaching for, oh, I would say uh, uh, more than uh, 12 years. And I come across many, many uh, families, the uh, so-called ultra high net worth individuals here in Asia specifically. And uh, you know, uh, 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 very often I uh, spend time with the so-called matriarch, patriarch of the family itself. And I always am curious of what are important issues uh, with them. And uh, over the years, I uh, am able to sort of summarize what, into what I call the three Ps or the three pres preservations itself. The first one is the preservation of wealth. And the second is the preservation of family harmony. And the third is preservation of family name, legacy, and value, and of course, social capital as well. So uh, these are the three uh, issues. First of all, preservation of family wealth, okay? I think we have to, uh, uh, here, I think uh, one should look at uh, family wealth, uh, uh, the creator of family wealth to the inheritors of uh, family wealth, because the first generation are basically the creators and their behavior and their outlook is somewhat different than the, the inheritors uh, of that. But, you know, again, it's both are important in terms of wealth preservation itself. The second is that, uh, you know, most uh, family wealth are created from the family business itself. However, when they reach a certain stage, they have some excess cash and so forth, and they look at investment, which is actually a little bit different than the uh, original founding uh, family business itself. So again, one has to differentiate the two of the uh, issues itself. Also, one of the things is that, uh, you, you know, nowadays, uh, you, you know, business life cycle, if you look at it, in the old days, the business life cycle is relatively long. But now with the Industrial Revolution 4.0, you, you know, given the uh, artificial intelligence, uh, IoT and uh, robotics and so forth, business life cycle is actually getting shorter and shorter, but surprising, surprising, 
human life cycle is getting longer and longer. So now we have sort of a, a challenge. The business life cycle is getting shorter, but the human life cycle is getting longer. So in one's lifespan, perhaps there are two, two or three uh, different uh, business cycles that we have to deal with itself. And that also uh, is important in terms of uh, wealth preservation itself. Okay, so again, why is preservation of wealth important to the wealth creator? You, you know, if you think about it, then, then the question is that, okay, uh, to maintain or improve family's lifestyle and well-being. And if you think about it, most creators of wealth, you, you know, they start off a very humble life itself, and they, they gradually build up some wealth, and their next generation are able to, you know, have uh, better opportunities, uh, especially educational opportunities and so forth. So these are, some, and lifestyle as well, okay? Yeah. So the, again, one of the things is that I always uh, talk to them and they say, you know, uh, pursue of one's own passion for the next generation is very, very important. You know, in the old days, we always look at the next generation. We want them to, uh, join the family business itself. But nowadays, given the life cycle of family business is relatively short, uh, does it really make sense for them or force them into the family business itself? How about if they just want to do other things? In fact, uh, uh, recently uh, in China, uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, uh, they did a study on the next generation and it turned out 80% of the next generation of uh, uh, in China itself, uh, the, they tend to be the second generation. They do not want to join the family business. Most of them want to start their own business itself. And their own business tend to be technology oriented. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with Chinese, they all, I always say, they all want to be horses. Why horses? They all want to mimic uh, Pony Ma or Jack Ma uh, of Tencent and uh, Alibaba and Ma in Chinese is horse. Okay, so they all want to be a horse in the future itself. So this is it. So the, uh, the, and the other challenge is that, you know, to retain wealth, you know, the families, of course, in China, you know, you have the single child policy, but in other places in the world, if one couple has two or three kids and their next generation have two or three, or each one, so the family tends to grow exponentially can the wealth actually grow exponentially? That is a big, big challenge. You know, when we make investments, if we get 20, 30% annual return, we're very, very happy. But we're talking about exponential growth. And so how do you keep the wealth and, uh, you know, maintain lifestyle and everything else? So this, again, become a uh, huge uh, challenge in life itself. Okay, so uh, we in uh, ethnic Chinese, I'm a Chinese, uh, uh, although I may not sound Chinese, uh, that's because I was brought up in the uh, United States itself, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. We have the saying, wealth does not go beyond three generations, okay? That's a, a very, very uh, uh, well-known Chinese phrase itself. But actually, uh, even Western uh, cultures have a similar saying, uh, shirt sleeves or shirt sleeve in three generations, or the Dutch people say clogs to clogs in three generations. So to maintain wealth in the same family for beyond three generations, it's one of the biggest challenges for many, many families itself. The second uh, we want to talk about is preservation of family harmony, okay? And uh, here I, I, I'd love to use this book cover and uh, up, uh, from uh, a book written by uh, Philip Marcovici. By the way, Philip uh, will be the uh, uh, guest speaker next Thursday. Uh, at the same time, I uh, highly recommend all of you listen to and, and uh, part, partake in his uh, talk. But the, look at the title of this thing, Destructive Power of Family Wealth. Okay, and we're talking about harmony. How do we maintain harmony if, uh, uh, you know, the uh, people are fighting over money? It tends to be money is the big, big problem itself. So here I, I identify specifically, for those of you who want more information, I identify four spe set, uh, specific uh, families and companies here in Hong Kong. Maybe you can go to all four. Okay, yeah, next one, next one. Yeah, 
Great Eagle, I just completed a case study. I'm also responsible for the case study at uh, HKUST, uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, Great Eagle, it's a very, very interesting, a second generation. And, and already this, uh, they uh, consist of six male descendants and three uh, female descendants. So three brothers are fighting with uh, the other three brothers. Bottom line, it's all money itself. Uh, for those of you actually uh, not from Hong Kong, if you ever visit Hong Kong, I highly recommend Yong Ki Restaurant. They're famous for their, their uh, duck. Uh, and again, only two brothers. And again, when the father passed away, boom, everything breaks loose, okay? Shenong Kai Property, it's one of the uh, major property owners here in Hong Kong itself. Again, uh, one brother against two brother. And uh, uh, sadly, the oldest brother just recently passed away. But uh, Again, it's all about money. Stanley Ho, uh, again, this is a well-known family uh, in, in Hong Kong, Macau, and uh, you, you can see the complexity when you have four wives, okay, and 13 offspring. And you can see how difficult it is to uh, maintain harmony itself. By the way, separately, and uh, you, people, you can separately contact me at a later date if you want. Uh, I'm sure through uh, we, we can provide you uh, my contacts. Uh, one family, the the Yu family of Yu Yun Sun, a very very well known family here in uh, this part of the world. This man had eleven wives. Can you imagine how complex uh, eleven wives can be? So again, how do you maintain harmony within a family? That's a, one of the biggest challenges itself. So this is a, a thing. One of the things. Okay, uh, I don't know if. Uh, uh, Faisal, you want to add something to specifically there, or you like to uh, wait till the end uh, to come? Yeah, I, I think um, let me let, let, let me take a step back on the on the harmony and unity side. So one of the things that you know, obviously, statistically, um, you know, when he's talking about shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves, and 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 the Chinese saying that we're you know don't make it past the third gen, statistically, ninety one percent of of families don't make it from the third to the first gen to the fourth gen. And the reason 60% of the time is due to communication and 10% of the time is due to trust. Now, again, all of these are what Roger is referring to as harmony and unity. And I wanna take things a step back and, and approach this a little differently. So many of us in, you know, in, you know, that are part of family business like myself, I'm a third generation family business member, um, you know, we hire the best of the best, whether it's Roger, whether it's Philip, whether it's John, whether it's, um, you know, Peter, whoever, you know, wh whoever you feel connects with you. But the thing is that what are the, there are four key parameters I feel that make it possible for, for us to even have a chance at having this harmony or unity that we're talking about. The first is that if our level of energy is not even there, which means driven by how we eat and drink, how we move and how we sleep, it's not even possible to show up in a state of being that will allow us to participate in whatever needs to happen to be able to create that harmony and, and, and unity. The second element is, is actually our level of presence and engagement, right? If we're continuously in thought and checked out and not present and engaged, we won't even have the capacity to listen, to understand, or speak to be understood. The third element is regarding our emotional state, right? That if I show up and I'm not calm, I'm not centered, and I'm, I'm, I'm reactive, right? Everything that is shared is going to create triggers, right? So we control two things in life, the meaning we give to everything that happens and our response. We touched on this with Kathleen. We touched on this with Dr. Sadegi. And the fourth element is really about our relational state, right? Our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with our loved ones and the family at large, where in, in reality, am I showing up with my stuff or am I showing up without imposition, without expectation and without judgment? So we are unfortunately creating a recipe for failure if these four elements are not truly worked upon and as a result, no matter how much of an incredible job Roger or Philip or Peter 
or, or John do to create that safe space to have the conversation that we all need to have to be able to move towards that harmony and unity, right? It's, it's going to be very challenging. So I urge you to, to, to consider these four elements so that what, what Roger is sharing today, which initially was the preservation of wealth, and now he'll talk about legacy and value system, is actually possible so that we can, as families, flip this statistic in our favor. Rather than being successful 9% of the time, what if we could flip it the other way around? Roger, back to you. Okay, great, thank you. Can we go to the PowerPoint again, yeah, please? We lost it. Let's say keep going. Apologies, where, okay, yeah. Okay, so the third P is uh, family value and legacy, preservation of family value and pregnancy, okay. So uh, what I'd like to uh, uh, also, uh, whilst we're here, I recently did a study and also I did a TED talk, a TEDx talk. Uh, you can look it up uh, in uh, uh, YouTube. I did a comparison between the overseas Chinese to Jewish diaspora because uh, there are lots of uh, similarities between the two culture itself. I being Chinese and uh, I have many, many uh, Jewish friends. And uh, so th this is uh, one of the uh, things itself. You know, the overseas Chinese now, unfortunately, uh, in the United States, uh, I have grandsons that are studying in the United States. Uh, I'm just not sure how safe they are anymore. You, you know, everyone's pretty much uh, against China these days. Um, you know, we, we've seen uh, uh, videos of uh, women getting beaten up uh, on the uh, underground system itself and so forth and so on. But anyway, the Chinese as well as the Jewish diaspora, the overseas Jewish people, uh, you, you know, uh, we are normally surrounded, whether it's in the United States or uh, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia for the Chinese and the Jewish people, of course, uh, all over the world. Uh, you, you know, uh, people are uh, hostile to us. And uh, I, I, I contribute that hostility towards uh, jealousy, quite frankly, you know, because uh, the Chinese overseas, as well as the Jewish people are quite successful, especially in a monetary sense. Uh, one of the uh, things is that uh, both the Jewish as well as the overseas Chinese uh, uh, are willing to work very, very hard itself, okay? And that, that reason to, to work hard is uh, survival. But the fact is that we work hard, okay, willing to do that. That's not necessarily true for all cultures itself, okay? So this is that. Well, uh, both the Jewish as well as the Chinese, we, we place a lot of emphasis in education. And of course, you know, today, the basic education is not enough. It's a continual learning process itself because the world is changing so rapidly. I earlier mentioned the Industrial Revolution 4.0. You know, uh, another 20 or uh, even less years, probably there'll be Industrial Revolution 4.0. 5.0. So things are changing so rapidly. You, you know, I, I recently was cleaning off uh, my office and, and, and uh, I discover an old so-called uh, mobile phone and it's the size of a brick, you know, compared to today's uh, uh, mobile phones. Uh, it's, it's nothing. In fact, there's more computing power in today's telephone, mobile phone, your own phone, than let's say uh, in the mid 1980s, uh, sorry, uh, mid 1960s, uh, all the computers combined in terms of uh, computing power itself. So learning process, this is very, very important. And this is both important for the Chinese as well as the Jewish people itself. So family unity, uh, this is very, very important. Now we value family unity and we talked about the, you know, the concept of uh, uh, harmony, unity and so forth. Township association for the Chinese. <clears throat> I don't know how many people uh, in the audience itself are have friends or are Chinese itself. You know, when you see another Chinese when you're overseas, you don't ask people, are you Chinese? You tend to say, where are you from? And if you're from the same location or the same town, you form this bondage. You have this common language and everything else. China is such a large uh, nation. Uh, you know, you can live in a village, uh, uh, let's say 100 miles away, and your, your, your dialect is totally different, although the uh, written language is the same. 
And, you know, we de depend on a lot on social network, okay, the Jewish people as well as our, ourselves. So these are important things, the value system itself. Frugality, especially the first generation people. Uh, you know, sometimes people say, oh, don't use those words, you know, especially if you're in front of uh, Jewish friends, you know, it's not being cheap, it's just being frugal. Even today, I, I uh, sometimes, you know, if I can save a little bit of money, I'll just save some money itself. So frugality is one of the key things and I'd like to make sure that these value systems are passed down to future generations. So, so it's very, very important. And uh, this is, uh, I, I thought since we're living in an environment, the COVID-19 uh, itself, uh, you know, today the wealth gap is increasing. This is one of the problems uh, of the world itself. You know, so-called the, you know, someone did a study recently, the 1% uh, wealthy individuals today own equivalent to uh, 40 plus percent of the, uh, the uh, bottom of uh, 40% of the world. And that wealth gap is increasing. And given what we have experienced today, that gap will probably even increase further. And this is gonna create some major, major problems and challenges for us. And you know, we may have to maintain value systems and all the things that I've shown here. I think it's something that I believe is, you know, to if you believe in these things and if you if you follow through these things these are the things that can really close the value gap itself okay so what i'd like to do is that you know, okay i talked about the preservation of uh, family wealth i talked about family uh, uh, harmony i talked about uh, family uh, legacy and value what i thought is it might be easier for everyone to understand these issues if i just use my own families uh, as an example and uh, so you can relate to it and uh, happy to answer any questions. So, okay, uh, maybe click once more. So, okay, oh, sorry, back up. Okay, uh, these are two pictures of my, uh, on, the, on the left side of the screen is my paternal grandfather and uh, on my right side, uh, on the right side of the screen is my maternal grandfather itself, okay? And uh, the reason why I wanna show you that is that these, individuals who are actually uh, quite successful uh, socially as well as financially. My uh, paternal grandfather, he was actually the first president of Bank of China for Zhejiang province itself. Uh, and my uh, maternal grandfather, he was actually head of the savings division for the uh, Bank of China itself. So as a result, the, my parents, uh, father and mother, uh, their marriage, I'm sure it's arranged marriage, and they, they got together when uh, uh, they were 18 years old. Okay, so uh, this is how, but that's uh, our, our uh, traditional way. But, uh, you know, th this is their uh, very prominent uh, bankers. Uh, Bank of China, of course, in those days, and even today is one of the largest bank in China itself. Okay, uh, here's a photo of, uh, taken in 1939. Uh, my father is, uh, I don't know how to point that, He's on the last row, not with the glasses, but the one that's standing next to the person. Yeah, that's my father. And uh, he was departing for the United States and uh, he was holding my older, oldest brother and I wasn't born yet, okay? And on the other side, uh, maybe I can move the, oh, did we, how, how do we go back up? Sorry, can you go back to the photo previous? Okay, uh, the, the woman on, uh, okay. Here, this is my mother, okay? And they're both uh, very, very young. So father, mother, and this is my oldest brother, and this is my youngest brother, okay? And they're, so I have two older brothers. And this is my great-grandmother, and this is my father, uh, great-grandfather, uh, the one that's uh, the uh, president of Bank of China. And by the way, in those days, he had two wives, okay? This is wife number one, wife number two. But in his case, it was interesting. The wife number one didn't have any offspring at all, okay? So we're all from uh, wife number two itself. And what's also interesting, this is my uh, father's uh, older brother. He had three wives, okay? So this is our culture itself. And by the way, this uh, young lady here is my aunt. And I actually recently visited her in Shanghai. Uh, she's now uh, uh, 103 years old, and she's still very, very healthy, okay? So 
My father left for the United States to study at the uh, University of Michigan, and he stu studied political science, okay? In those days, very, very unusual. And I think he just went there, uh, quite frankly, he just wanted the, what I call gold plating, and he's gonna study for two years and come back to the United States, uh, come back to, from the United States to China and say, oh, I have a, a master's degree from uh, the United States. Uh, and th this is quite, but then unfortunately the war broke out and he, he and my mother were not able to go back. So basically myself and my sister were born in the United States. So now you know how old I am, okay. Yeah, okay. So we actually returned to, uh, as a family, uh, my two older brothers actually stayed in China uh, with the grandparents because it was only expected a short trip uh, for my uh, father and my father and mother went there. So the two older brothers uh, physically stayed uh, with the uh, one with uh, the number one grandmother and the, the other one with number two grandmother itself. So we actually returned to Shanghai uh, uh, and for me it was the very first time to go back to Shanghai in 1946. This is after World War II, of course. Yeah, everything pretty much settled down. This is our house in uh, Shanghai itself. Uh, this uh, is in the middle of the town and it's a palatial house and all this green stuff you see, it used to be a garden, okay? And now, it, why it's a basketball court and everything else, it's actually uh, the uh, administration building of one of the uh, primary schools over there. And I would, uh, visited the uh, house uh, about five years ago and the security guard asked me, why are you here? So I told him I actually lived here when I was a young boy. And uh, so I actually gave him a house tour and uh, he was very, very interested in uh, the, uh, the uh, tour itself. So we had a very uh, palatial house in the middle of uh, Shanghai. This is middle of the town, not on the outskirts, okay? And, uh, uh, and the house is still there, so you know, uh, yeah. So um, in 1951, uh, my oldest brother, the one that my father was carrying, uh, he at the age of 14, the communists came in 1948. And we uh, as a family stayed behind. Uh, we did not leave. We originally were going to go to uh, uh, Hong Kong, uh, but last minute my uh, grandparents decided to stay uh, in Shanghai and not to leave. And so my brother, the uh, the 14 year old at the age of 14, uh, 1951, he joined the People Liberation Army without permission, okay? Uh, next to him is my mother at the time. Uh, later on, she visited him when he was in the army. But this was uh, actually the uh, turning point in our lives. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, because of him, uh, my mother and my father, they all decided to leave China, otherwise, I think I today still be in China itself, okay? So uh, this, he, I, I thank him uh, every time I see him. I say, thank you very much. Had you not joined the army, I'd still be in China today. So anyhow, so uh, we went back and returned to New York in 1952. And we actually had to, uh, 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 we uh, spent a year in Hong Kong because my other brother, the older brother, uh, he did not have a, a passport to come to the United States and it took him almost a year to get, get him a passport to come to the United States itself. So we went to New York. Uh, I wanna show this, it's very, very interesting. Uh, I don't know how many people are aware of this uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, okay? This happened in uh, 1884, I think. Uh, what was uh, very interesting was that the Chinese after the, uh, the, uh, the uh, rail system and the uh, gold mining on the west coast of the United States, they were working very, very hard and they took a lot of jobs away from the local, the Irish people and so forth and so on. So they came up with an act that basically the Chinese were excluded, okay? And Chinese could not bring their families to the, there and so forth and so on. And so you can see that the, so you can actually look it up. It's a Chinese exclusion act. So uh, when my father went to the United States uh, uh, together with him and everything else, so he, initially he tried to start his own business uh, in import-export, but quite frankly, it did not succeed. Part of the reason was that the Korean War broke out and uh, he, you know, there was all kinds of sanctions, so he couldn't do anything. So at, at, at that time, uh, having a political science degree and master's degree from the University of Michigan, he just couldn't get a job. 
quite frankly. Nobody would hire a Chinese in those days. So the only thing he could do was working in a restaurant as a, as a uh, waiter itself, okay? So, you know, from uh, the president's uh, of a bank, uh, now he's working as a, as a waiter itself. And uh, quite frankly, uh, summer months, uh, I was a dishwasher and my other brother, the older uh, number two brother, uh, he was a busboy working in a restaurant itself. So we had to go through a whole period, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we had to put up hardship. And my mother, you know, married at 18, she never had a proper education. So she was working in a millinery, uh, you know, just doing piecework. Again, very, very difficult. And we were living in New York City at the time. So I just want to show this uh, photo with that to everyone. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> I, I want to talk about a little about, uh, again, extending in my family and talk about family uh, harmony and uh, uh, family unity itself. So, you know, we were, my brother, uh, my sister and myself, you know, we we're very, very fortunate. Uh, we managed to get an education itself and so forth and so on. So, uh, and uh, so eventually I started my own business and I came back to Hong Kong. So I want to uh, elaborate a little bit more on the sort of family harmony and family unity aspect, okay? This is an interesting picture. It's a pyramid. Uh, this was, uh, uh, this picture was taken in 1985, okay? And this is actually, uh, the uh, my children's generation together with my uh, uh, their cousins from my wife's side and all together there are 13 of them and uh, it's very very interesting of the 13 cousins uh, 10 of them are Ivy League graduates okay so you know uh, we'll talk about that a little bit yeah next picture so actually starting from 1985 every year we have a family reunion and every time we have a family reunion, we go to the same beach and we do the same uh, pyramid. As you can see now, they're older, they have their own family and uh, they're having trouble climbing on top of each other. But the thing is that the family gets together, together now with the spouses and everything else. And uh, you know, we do this every single year, okay? Yep, next please. Now you can, this is a little bit more recent. Now they can't even climb on top of each other. <laughs> you know, they're, they're at the age of, you know, so they're standing there, make believe it's a, it's a pyramid itself. So uh, again, go on. This is the fourth generation. Okay, I call myself second generation, and this is the fourth generation. So now they continue the pyramid concept itself. And again, we do this every time, people are now all over the world, but whenever we can get together and then, by the way, we do this at Christmas time, and then we get together at the same beach, and we do the pyramid again, okay? Again, and this is probably a more recent. Uh, again, you can see the family expanded a lot. And again, I want to remind everyone, we do this pyramid every single year, okay? Uh, then of the same generations, myself, um, uh, together, uh, I guess I, I'm uh, the one with the gray hair, okay? And, and uh, so this is my wife's uh, siblings and uh, spouses. So we tried to get together also. This is a cruise that we took in uh, 2009. And uh, you know, whenever we have an opportunity, we always get together uh, itself, okay? Next. And also the Christmas, we always, every single year, again, you know, when we do the pyramid is on one side of Hong Kong, uh, we go to Hong Kong Disneyland. And we have a group photo taken, and this is more recent, uh, 19, uh, I think 2017. Uh, again, you can see how the family has grown. And again, every single year we have this uh, group photo, photo taken itself. Uh, this is also very, very interesting. This is uh, a memorial hall. <clears throat> uh, my great, my grandfather, uh, paternal grandfather, he was a major philanthropist uh, in, in Hanzhou. Uh, just, uh, you, you know, where he uh, lived. And uh, in fact, uh, recently, one of the secondary schools, they celebrated their 85th uh, anniversary. And in their archive, uh, they discovered that in 1946, my grandfather donated equivalent to 2 million US dollars uh, at that time. So, you know, 2 million today is worth a lot to the school and they built a whole wing. And uh, so, the, even the communists 
built a memorial hall uh, on his behalf. So this is the, the memorial hall of my uh, grandfather uh, outside of Hanzo itself, yeah. Uh, so uh, again, on my side of the family, we also have some reunion. The, uh, the lady, uh, the older lady in the middle with a lot of gray hair, uh, that is my aunt. That, that's the one I mentioned earlier, that's uh, 103 years old. And th this is my cousins and everything else. And we had a celebration of uh, uh, the, uh, my uh, uh, grandfather's uh, uh, event in front of the Memorial Hall itself. I also mentioned importance of education itself. And uh, 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 we can go a little bit. I mentioned that the, my children and uh, their cousins, uh, 13 of them, uh, of the 13, 10 are Ivy League graduates, okay? Uh, this is uh, the top row are the schools that I attended, uh, University of Michigan, following my father's uh, footstep. Uh, my master's degree was uh, uh, at MIU. Uh, incidentally, my first two degrees are in electrical engineering, and, and I, uh, my first job was at the Bell Labs uh, at uh, New Jersey, working for the military research lab. I always joke around today. I say, today, I don't think I've, I've be offered a military research job. They think I'll be a spy, right? And uh, the next one is uh, Harvard, Harvard Business School. Oh, sorry, go back, please. Yeah, uh, then uh, HKUST, and I'll talk about that. The second row is uh, my children itself. The first one is Phillips Academy. All three of my children went to Phillips Academy. Uh, for those of you familiar with it, it's uh, one of the better uh, boarding schools. <coughs> and uh, so uh, th this is, uh, he, 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 you know, and uh, one of my sons, uh, after he graduated from Phillips Academy, he was a little bit too young, and he actually spent a year at Eton. Uh, David Cameron was his classmate, so was, uh, so was uh, 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 the various others, uh, okay? And he was also uh, uh, a Harvard grad, okay? He uh, finished his Harvard graduate. Uh, my daughter and my other son, uh, they're, uh, Wharton and uh, University of Pennsylvania graduates and my two sons when they graduated from uh, university, I actually sent them to Beijing University to learn uh, Chinese culture itself. The last bottom row is uh, my grandchildren, okay? Uh, one went to Hotchkiss, uh, the one on the very, uh, again, uh, boarding school in Connecticut. Uh, the second one is uh, Marlboro, uh, a well-known boarding school in UK. And uh, I have two granddaughters that are in uh, Cheltenham Ladies College, again in UK. And uh, now two of my grandsons are at university. Uh, one is at Princeton and the other one's at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I want to show this photo. This is, uh, you know, I started my uh, PhD degree uh, 40 years before I got it. It took me 40 years to get my PhD. Uh, I think it was a little bit of peer pressure. One of my brother has a PhD. My, sister's husband is PhD, so ultimately I went back and got my PhD. Even though I started with uh, electrical engineering and computer science and everything else, I finally got my PhD in 2006 uh, after 40 years uh, in uh, finance. So that, that's uh, you know, the current situation itself. Next, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, family legacy itself. <clears throat> Again, legacy is very, very important. Okay, next, please. Okay, these are what we have done is that we now have books written about uh, the uh, grandparents. And I commissioned uh, people to do these books. And so both my paternal, grand, uh, uh, paternal and maternal grandparents, uh, we have books uh, on them. And, uh, the, and I make sure that each of the grandchildren all have uh, these uh, books itself, very, very important itself. So in the future, they have some, some reference point to, uh, to look uh, uh, towards uh, the parents, grandparents, and family. This is my father-in-law. My wife, actually, uh, she wrote these books on her father. Her father was uh, one of the major, well, at one time, he was the largest ship owner in the world. By the way, he started, he never finished secondary school itself. So, he, you know, self-made man itself. And uh, so he's been uh, very, very successful. Uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> This is also very, very interesting. My father-in-law, who never finished uh, secondary school himself, but he valued education a lot. He bought the old Queen Elizabeth uh, passenger ship. At that time, it was the world's largest passenger ship. And he converted that to a floating university. 
they call the Seawise University. And uh, when that ship was being converted here in Hong Kong, unfortunately caught fire and the Hong Kong fire department wasn't equipped to, uh, to put out a fire on a ship. They pumped too much water and ultimately the ship sank. Uh, but having his mission, he actually bought another ship and the thing, so if you look up a uh, semester at sea, uh, he's the founder of semester at sea. Again, value for education, everything else. Next, please. Uh, again, uh, my wife did this, uh, uh, created a museum, a maritime museum. Uh, this is in uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University because originally my, uh, you know, our, our family backgrounds all from Shanghai, Shanghai area itself. So if you ever go to Shanghai, uh, please stop in. And uh, this is, used to be a boys dormitory and the Jiao Tong University was gonna tear it down. And uh, then my wife said, please don't tear it down. I'll, I'll convert it, uh, do something. And she converted into a, a maritime museum itself. So again, that's a legacy issue itself. Uh, this again, I mentioned earlier <clears throat> that my uh, uh, paternal grandfather, he uh, donated money to a secondary school. So what happened was that after my uh, study between the comparative study between overseas Chinese to a Jewish diaspora, uh, I was asked to give it the same talk at uh, Tel Aviv University. And so I did uh, do that. And uh, the university invited me to be a uh, board of governors over there. Then whilst I was in Tel Aviv itself, I discovered that they have a summer program for gifted kids, uh, especially for those that are interested in what they call STEM program, science, technology, engineering, math. Uh, and uh, so they were bringing in Jewish kids from all over the world and so forth and so on to come and spent several weeks uh, in Tel Aviv itself during the summer. So I asked them whether I can host a group of uh, people from China. They said, yes, no problem at all. So what happened was that I created a scholarship in the name of my grandfather and to uh, invite 16 kids to uh, go to the summer program. So the three criteria are, one, they have to like STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, math. Two, they have to have some basic English uh, skills. Uh, and third is they have to come from a family that under ordinary circumstances would not be able to send these kids there. So this is the first occasion, 2017, and was a huge success. It was a major, major success. And we did it again, 2018. Then it was such a success. Then I thought of uh, something. I said, wait a second, there's something missing. How about having the Jewish kids also spend some time in China itself? So in 2019, I created a program with 40 kids now, 16 from uh, Tel Aviv, 16 from uh, uh, China, and eight from Macau and Hong Kong. 40 kids spend three weeks together, one week in each location. And so we have this scholarship fund specifically for that in the name of my uh, grandfather. It's a small sum, but I think this kind of forming bonding, friendshipness, and everything else is uh, very, very important. Uh, next one, please. And this is, you can see, this is last year, and this is uh, basically all the kids uh, standing in front of my uh, grandfather's uh, memorial hall and in, in, uh, outside of Hanzo itself. So I think this is, uh, I wanted to give you some example of uh, what I mean by the three preservation itself. I didn't talk about financial preservation. I just want to focus specifically on family harmony and family legacy and value system itself. So, uh, All right, Roger. So we've got we've got a few questions coming in. So you okay. referred to that eighty percent of the next gen in China, obviously, you know, mostly second gen, wants mm -hmm. to do their own. That doesn't want to join the family business. Right. Uh, but now, what if they wanted to start their own business? Should funds be made available at arm's length? like a mm -hmm. bank? Should there be any oversight? What, what are you seeing in the families that you, you advise? Okay, uh, it's a very, very good and relevant question. One of the things I uh, 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 talk to these uh, various families that, you know, nowadays a lot of families are in the process of setting up so-called family office itself. And in the family office, you know, most people think of family office purely for investment purposes. In fact, I'd like to incorporate all elements, all three P's that in the family office itself. 
And also I recommend to these families to allocate some what I call angel fund for next generation to start their own venture. They may or may not succeed, but the fact is that, you know, give them the opportunity to try it out. It, it, this is important. And, you know, the, the ability to, to, to uh, uh, try out these uh, so-called passion in their life. This is very, very important. So I would recommend families allocate a small sum. It doesn't have to be a very, very large sum. You know, in fact, my own businesses that I started uh, many years ago uh, were very, very, uh, you know, uh, small sums that uh, I was able to secure uh, from family itself. And uh, it's, it's very important because you also want to leverage for us in uh, this part of the world, uh, the social capital of the family. So it's not just the financial capital, but the social capital of the family is, is very, very important. So again, definitely uh, leverage off the family and uh, have the family set up a uh, small sum uh, specifically for, for that, okay? <clears throat> and uh, going on the other side, so those who actually want to join the family business, right? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you look at, how do you address merit and meritocracy and fairness when it comes to admitting or not admitting those family members into the core family business, yeah. into the overall family office that you've mentioned in terms of the three Ps, it would obviously be much easier. But let's say they wanted to get into the core business. What, what are you well, seeing? Yeah, I, I, I think you know, some, some uh, uh, do want to join the core uh, family business itself. I think you know, the whole idea is that your, 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 your descendants, you have a whole life to, to observe them. And uh, you, you know, there's a summer internship program so you can introduce uh, to allow them to, to have a benefit of that. The other thing is that uh, some families, incidentally, uh, okay, you'd like to join the family business, but you must work outside for a number of years or whatever it is. So they get the taste of how it is to work outside before jumping into the family business itself, okay? So if their passion is to work in a family business, why not? But train them properly and, and, and make sure this is really their passion. You know, passion has become now a very sexy word, right? For the next gen yeah. that they, if they, they say, if I love it, I put the effort. And if I don't, I just chug along. So, you know, Chugging that whole level the of hard right? work and, and discipline is becoming a debate. I mean, obviously from what you shared from your next gen, um, you know, that's, they're, they're all hard hitting on the education side, but not everybody is privileged to be a custodian of that level of, of intellectual capacity, right, Roger? So some yeah, of us no, have- uh, you're absolutely right, yeah. I mean, like, uh, for example, one of my grandson, uh, he, he uh, always wanted to be a, uh, a musician, and that's what he's doing, uh, the one that's now at Northwestern, and he chose that school because of their music program. And, and, and uh, you know, in the old days, if he goes to grandparents and say, by the way, I want to be a musician, for Chinese to say, well, there's something wrong with this uh, kid, you know. Uh, how are you going to make money, right? So today, uh, if he, you know, we're fortunate enough, we're in a position that uh, allows him to pursue his passion, and I encourage him to do that. And so, again, think about it. Anything one wants to do successfully, passion is essential. Opportunity and passion. So that means that that there will be some family members that will not necessarily add to the kitty going forward, right? You talked about exponential growth of, mm -hmm. of, of the wealth, right? While some will be following their passion and maybe just, um, you know, obviously utilizing funds that are there for the family versus right. others that will be adding. So how, how is that being balanced in the families that you see? Well, you know, again, yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, uh, s somehow the money has to be, you know, the wealth has to be properly distributed, okay? I, I mean, the, but, you know, again, I'll, I'll give you an example of one of my uh, uh, grandsons, again. He's the one that's uh, at the age of 14, went to UK, a mall girl, to study uh, at the boarding school, and he came back, uh, uh, first Christmas, I asked him, oh, how's Scoop? He said, oh, he loves Scoop, but he started a new business. I said, what? At the age of 14, he started a new business? I said, what kind of business are you in? 
He said, actually, I'm now selling cup noodles in the dormitory. Okay. So again, you know, his passion is entrepreneurship. And he's going to, I think someday he'll be an entrepreneur starting something because that, that's a passion he has, right? And it doesn't have to be selling cup noodles necessarily. But the fact is that he's interested, not cup noodle, he's interested in making money. And that, that's his passion. And, and uh, I mean, it reminds me when I was living in New York City at the time, uh, people came to me and said, uh, saw me, uh, said, Roger, are you Chinese? I said, yes. I said, by the way, can you uh, get me some firecrackers? You know, I'm the uh, similar age as him, firecrackers. Well, I did search and so forth, and I did find it in a, in a neighborhood that was very safe uh, in those days. Uh, I did manage to find firecrackers. And I bought these uh, firecrackers, 20 firecrackers for uh, a pack of uh, 10 cents US. And I brought it back and I sold it for 20. So that, 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 that's pretty. And that's why at the end of the day, I, I started many, many business over the years. I, I'm considered a serial entrepreneur itself, okay? So, uh, you know, entrepreneurial uh, issues are, are part of a uh, family's uh, DNA itself, okay? So we have a question here. What advice would you give regarding family harmony if the spouses that are coming in don't necessarily share the same values and the passion that the family legacy was built on? How, what, what, what are you seeing to help with that process of, of embracing everyone into that, into that flow? Yeah, well, this is a very, very, uh, uh, sensitive issue itself. Uh, you know, uh, when you're bringing up children and grandchildren, you'd like to give them the value system. So when they start dating, they're looking for future spouses that have a similar value system itself, rather than going out to uh, totally uh, uh, someone from a uh, different, different background culturally or otherwise. I'm not talking about financially, right? Uh, if their value system is very, very different itself. And of course, you know, one of the sensitive issues uh, these days is that unfortunately divorce rate is rather high nowadays. And also uh, many families now require the outside spouse coming in uh, to uh, sign an agreement, so-called prenup agreement itself. And uh, so, you know, the question of signing prenup, I think it's, uh, it's sensitive. How do you bring it up? And, uh, but sometimes it's necessary. So I think the uh, future spouses, they have to understand the family, the family value. And if they don't really like it, because uh, if that is really the case, then I think your descendants should not necessarily try to marry those people. You, you know, that's just going to create problems in the future. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've advised families where we've seen that if the the person marrying in is not willing to sign the prenup because they believe in, in bloodline only. This happens a lot in Europe. Um, they will just skip a generation. Are, are you seeing that as well in Asia or is that mostly a European? Well, it's a, it's a relatively new concept itself. You know, this uh, prenup uh, concept. But I think, you know, hopefully the spouse and your descendants uh, uh, have similar value system. Otherwise, to bring someone into uh, a, a, a relationship when they have two different uh, backgrounds. Uh, it's just asking for, in my opinion, uh, potential problems in the future. Um, you know, today we've created this series based on all the, you know, everything that's coming up in families from health to relationships to businesses being challenged. Um, do you, do you see that, now the families and the family offices are starting to more than ever consider encompassing these three P's than ever before? Uh, well, we are trying to uh, uh, propagate this and uh, we're seeing now people liking the idea that, uh, yeah, so most people that I speak to, uh, they now say, oh yes, uh, Roger, uh, I understand what you're saying and uh, it, it seems to make a lot of sense. So, so you, they had heard it from you, they'd heard it from, obviously, I, I do a lot of speaking as well. We've written an article together, which we'll share with those who are, who are watching and, and, and attending. But are you, do, you, do you see that the, 
that, that the rubber is meeting the road or is it still talk? Uh, I think uh, it's meeting the road, but you know, it does take time. You know, mm -hmm. you know uh, nowadays uh, one has to expect, uh, you, you know, uh, we're, we live in a globalized uh, environment. So people are different and have a uh, sort of different value system. And we have to make sure when people have from different value system uh, have the ability to you know, uh, uh, work together. So this, I think, uh, you know, to make a happy marriage, uh, it's, it's important to have people have a similar value system. All right, Roger, we've got just a few more minutes left. Um, you know, it was, it was really incredible to listen to, to the three Ps and, and, and be part of the process to share in a different way the, the second P with you. Are there any closing remarks or recommendations that you would give to those listening and those who have missed it, obviously, will have the honor and privilege to watch the recording. Is there something that you'd like to share uh, before we, 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 we close? Well, I, I, uh, the concept of 3P is not just my own journey itself. I've observed that with other families that, uh, you know, many, many friends uh, that I have. And I think, uh, uh, to me, uh, it seems to uh, uh, make sense, okay? At least, of course, when I say it, it, of course, it makes sense. But I'm hoping that, uh, you know, other people feel uh, they have similar uh, uh, thoughts. And I'm uh, happy to discuss these things with anyone that have similar or different uh, views. So in terms of statistics, right, we're now 99 versus 91, right? One of the missions we have as Genetic Care, bringing the Family Health Office concept to, which is basically more or less P number two. Into this, into this space and into existence is to flip these stats in our advantage. How confident are you that we will be able to do this as a plug-in of your three Ps? Well, I think if you work hard at it, yes, I'm quite confident, but it, it does take work. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Roger, for your time, yeah, your generosity, no your sharing, you. your wisdom. Um, we have, as Roger mentioned, Philip Markovici next Thursday. And in the meantime, on Monday, we are gonna be supporting those who are you know, helping their children homeschool. And on Wednesday, there'll be Dr. D who will be going through actually um, concepts of, of yoga, then doing some breathing exercises, some journaling, as well as, as uh, gratitude. So please join us. Um, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And uh, once again, thank you very much for the generosity of your time and participating and, and asking the questions and making this an interactive experience. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.